Chapter 10. The Superior, the Very Reverend John Conmey S. Jay reset his smooth watch in his interior pocket as he came down the presbytery steps. 5 to 3. Just nice time to walk to Artane. What was that boy's name again? Dignam. Yes. Veer Dignam at Eustamest. Brother Swan was the person to see. Mr. Cunningham's letter. Yes. Oblige him, if possible. Good practical Catholic, useful at mission time. A one-legged sailor, swinging himself onward by lazy jerks of his crutches, growled some notes. He jerked short before the convent of the Sisters of Charity and held out a peaked cap for alms towards the very Reverend John Conmey S.J. Father Conmey blessed him in the sun for his purse held, he knew, one silver crown. Father Conmey crossed to Mount Joy Square. He thought, but not for long, of soldiers and sailors, whose legs had been shot off by cannonballs, ending their days in some pauper ward, and of Cardinal Woolsey's words, if I had served my God as I have served my King he would not have abandoned me in my old days. He walked by the tree shade of sunny winking leaves, and towards him came the wife of Mr. David Sheehy MP very well, indeed, Father. And you, Father? Father Conmey was wonderfully well indeed. He would go to Buxton probably for the waters. And her boys, were they getting on well at Belvedere? Was that so? Father Conmey was very glad indeed to hear that. And Mr. Sheehy himself? Still in London. The house was still sitting, to be sure it was. Beautiful weather it was, delightful indeed. Yes, it was very probable that Father Bernard Vaughan would come again to preach. Oh, yes, a very great success. A wonderful man really. Father Conmey was very glad to see the wife of Mr. David Sheehy MP looking so well and he begged to be remembered to Mr. David Sheehy MP yes, he would certainly call. Good afternoon, Mrs. Sheehy. Father Conmey doffed his silk hat and smiled, as he took leave, at the jet beads of her mantilla ink shining in the sun. And smiled yet again, in going. He had cleaned his teeth, he knew, with a reek nut paste. Father Conmey walked and, walking, smiled for he thought on Father Bernard Vaughan's droll eyes and cockney voice. Pilot. Why don't you old back that owl and mob? A zealous man, however. Really he was. And really did great good in his way. Beyond a doubt. He loved Ireland, he said, and he loved the Irish. Of good family too would one think it? Welsh, were they not? Oh, lest he forget. That letter to Father Provincial. Father Conmey stopped three little schoolboys at the corner of Mountjoy Square. Yes, they were from Belvedere. The little house. Aha! And were they good boys at school? Oh that was very good now. And what was his name? Jack Sohan. And his name? Gare. Gallagher. And the other little man? His name was Brunny Linham. Oh, that was a very nice name to have. Father Conmey gave a letter from his breast to Master Brunny Linham and pointed to the red pillar box at the corner of Fitzgibbon Street. But mind you don't post yourself into the box, little man, he said. The boy six-eyed Father Conmey and laughed, Oh, sir. Well, let me see if you can post a letter, Father Conmey said. Master Brunny Linham ran across the road and put Father Conmey's letter to Father Provincial into the mouth of the bright red letter box. Father Conmey smiled and nodded and smiled and walked along Mount Joy Square East. Mr. Dennis J. Maginney, professor of dancing and sea, in silk hat, slate frock coat with silk facings, white kerchief tie, tight lavender trousers, canary gloves and pointed patent boots, walking with grave deportment most respectfully took the curbstone as he passed Lady Maxwell at the corner of Dignam's Court. Was that not Mrs. McGuinness? Mrs. McGuinness, stately, silver-haired, bowed to Father Conmey from the farther footpath along which she sailed. And Father Conmey smiled and saluted. How did she do? A fine carriage she had. Like Mary, Queen of Scots, something. And to think that she was a pawnbroker. Well, now. Such a. What should he say? Such a queenly mean. Father Conmey walked down Great Charles Street and glanced at the shut-up free church on his left. The Reverend T. R. Green B. A. Will, D. V., speak. The incumbent they called him. He felt it incumbent on him to say a few words. But one should be charitable. Invincible ignorance. They acted according to their lights. Father Conmey turned the corner and walked along the North Circular Road. It was a wonder that there was not a tram line in such an important thoroughfare. Surely, there ought to be. A band of satcheled schoolboys crossed from Richmond Street. All raised untidy caps. Father Conmey greeted them more than once benignly. Christian brother boys. Father Conmey smelt incense on his right hand as he walked. St. Joseph's Church, Portland Row. For aged and virtuous females. 
Father Conmi raised his hat to the blessed sacrament. Virtuous, but occasionally they were also bad-tempered. Near Aldborough House Father Conmi thought of that spendthrift nobleman. And now it was an office or something. Father Conmi began to walk along the North Strand Road and was saluted by Mr. William Gallagher who stood in the doorway of his shop. Father Conmi saluted Mr. William Gallagher and perceived the odours that came from bacon flitches and ample cools of butter. He passed Grogan's the tobacconist against which newsboards leaned and told of a dreadful catastrophe in New York. In America those things were continually happening. Unfortunate people to die like that, unprepared. Still, an act of perfect contrition. Father Conmi went by Daniel Bergen's public house against the window of which two unlaboring men lounged. They saluted him and were saluted. Father Conmi passed H. J. O'Neill's funeral establishment where Corny Kelleher totted figures in the daybook while he chewed a blade of hay. A constable on his beat saluted Father Conmi and Father Conmi saluted the constable. In Eukstetters, the pork butchers, Father Conmi observed pigs' puddings, white and black and red, lie neatly curled in tubes. Moored under the trees of Charleville Mall Father Conmi saw a turf barge, a towhorse with pendant head, a bargeman with a hat of dirty straw seated amidships, smoking and staring at a branch of poplar above him. It was idyllic, and Father Conmi reflected on the providence of the Creator who had made turf to be in bogs whence men might dig it out and bring it to town and hamlet to make fires in the houses of poor people. On Newcomen Bridge the very Reverend John Conmi S. J. of St. Francis Xavier's Church, Upper Gardner Street, stepped on to an outward-bound tram. Off an inward-bound tram stepped the Reverend Nicholas Dudley C. C. of St. Agatha's Church, North William Street, on to Newcomen Bridge. At Newcomen Bridge Father Conmi stepped into an outward-bound tram for he disliked to traverse on foot the dingy way past Mud Island. Father Conmi sat in a corner of the tramcar, a blue ticket tucked with care in the eye of one plump kid glove, while four shillings, a sixpence and five pennies shooted from his other plump glove palm into his purse. Passing the Ivy Church he reflected that the ticket inspector usually made his visit when one had carelessly thrown away the ticket. The solemnity of the occupants of the car seemed to Father Conmi excessive for a journey so short and cheap. Father Conmi liked cheerful decorum. It was a peaceful day. The gentleman with the glasses opposite Father Conmi had finished explaining and looked down. His wife, Father Conmi supposed. A tiny yawn opened the mouth of the wife of the gentleman with the glasses. She raised her small gloved fist, yawned ever so gently, tip-tapping her small gloved fist on her opening mouth and smiled tinnily, sweetly. Father Conmi perceived her perfume in the car. He perceived also that the awkward man at the other side of her was sitting on the edge of the seat. Father Conmi at the altar rails placed the host with difficulty in the mouth of the awkward old man who had the shaky head. At Ansley Bridge the tram halted and, when it was about to go, an old woman rose suddenly from her place to alight. The conductor pulled the bell strap to stay the car for her. She passed out with her basket and a market net, and Father Conmi saw the conductor help her and net and basket down, and Father Conmi thought that, as she had nearly passed the end of the penny fare, she was one of those good souls who had always to be told twice bless you, my child, that they have been absolved, pray for me. But they had so many worries in life, so many cares, poor creatures. From the hoardings Mr. Eugene Stratton grimaced with thick nigger lips at Father Conmi. Father Conmi thought of the souls of black and brown and yellow men and of his sermon on St. Peter Claver S. J. and the African mission and of the propagation of the faith and of the millions of black and brown and yellow souls that had not received the baptism of water when their last hour came like a thief in the night. That book by the Belgian Jesuit, Le Nombre de Ellis, seemed to Father Conmi a reasonable plea. Those were millions of human souls created by God in his own likeness to whom the faith had not, d.v., been brought. But they were God's souls, created by God. It seemed to Father Conmi a pity that they should all be lost, a waste, if one might say. At the Hoth Road stop Father Conmi alighted, was saluted by the conductor and saluted in his turn. The Malahide Road was quiet. It pleased Father Conmi, road and name. The joy bells were ringing in gay Malahide. Lord Talbot de Malahide, immediate hereditary Lord Admiral of Malahide and the seas adjoining. Then came the call to arms and she was made, wife and widow in one day. Those were old worldish days, loyal times in joyous townlands, old times in the barony. Father Conmi, walking, thought of his little book Old Times in the Barony and of the book that might be written about Jesuit houses and of Mary Rochefort, daughter of Lord Molesworth, first Countess of Belvedere. A listless lady, no more young, walked alone the shore of Loch Ennell, Mary, first Countess of Belvedere, listlessly walking in the evening, not startled when an otter plunged. Who could know the truth? Not the jealous Lord Belvedere and not her confessor if she had not committed adultery fully, 
a Aquilatio Seminis in ter vas natural mulieres, with her husband's brother? She would half confess if she had not all sinned as women did. Only God knew and she and he, her husband's brother. Father Conmi thought of that tyrannous incontinence, needed however for man's race on earth, and of the ways of God which were not our ways. Don John Conmi walked and moved in times of yore. He was humane and honored there. He bore in mind secrets confessed and he smiled at smiling noble faces in a beeswax drawing room, kaled with full fruit clusters. And the hands of a bride and of a bridegroom, noble to noble, were impalmed by Don John Conmi. It was a charming day. The lichgate of a field showed Father Conmi breadths of cabbages, curtsying to him with ample underleaves. The sky showed him a flock of small white clouds going slowly down the wind. Moutonner, the French said. A just and homely word. Father Conmi, reading his office, watched a flock of muttoning clouds over Rath Coffee. His thin-socked ankles were tickled by the stubble of Klongo's field. He walked there, reading in the evening, and heard the cries of the boys' lines at their play, young cries in the quiet evening. He was their rector, his reign was mild. Father Conmi drew off his gloves and took his redaged breviary out. An ivory bookmark told him the page. Nuns. He should have read that before lunch. But Lady Maxwell had come. Father Conmi read in secret Pater and Av and crossed his breast. Deus in auditorium. He walked calmly and read mutely the nuns, walking and reading till he came to reason in Beati Immaculati, Principium Verborum Tuorum Veritas, in Eternum Omnia Iadisha Iastiti Tua. A flushed young man came from a gap of a hedge and after him came a young woman with wild nodding daisies in her hand. The young man raised his cap abruptly, the young woman abruptly bent and with slow care detached from her light skirt a clinging twig. Father Conmi blessed both gravely and turned a thin page of his breviary. Sin, Principes Persecuti sunt me gratis, et a verbis tuis formative at cor meum. Corny Kelleher closed his long daybook and glanced with his drooping eye at a pine coffin lid sentried in a corner. He pulled himself erect, went to it and, spinning it on its axle, viewed its shape and brass furnishings. Chewing his blade of hay he laid the coffin lid by and came to the doorway. There he tilted his hat brim to give shade to his eyes and leaned against the Dorcas, looking oddly out. Father John Conmi stepped into the Dolomount tram on Newcomen Bridge. Corny Kelleher locked his large-footed boots and gazed, his hat down tilted, chewing his blade of hay. Constable 57C, on his beat, stood to pass the time of day. That's a fine day, Mr. Kelleher. Eh, Corny Kelleher said. It's very close, the constable said. Corny Kelleher sped a silent jet of he juice arching from his mouth while a generous white arm from a window in Eccles Street flung forth a coin. What's the best news? He asked. I seen that particular party last evening, the constable said with bated breath. A one-legged sailor crutched himself round McConnell's corner, skirting Rabiati's ice cream car, and jerked himself up Eccles Street. Towards Larry O'Rourke, in shirt sleeves in his doorway, he growled unamiably, for England. He swung himself violently forward past Katie and Booty Daedalus, halted and growled, home and beauty. J. J. Omeloy's white care-worn face was told that Mr. Lambert was in the warehouse with a visitor. A stout lady stopped, took a copper coin from her purse and dropped it into the cap held out to her. The sailor grumbled, thanks, glanced sourly at the unheeding windows, sank his head and swung himself forward four strides. He halted and growled angrily, for England. Two barefoot urchins, sucking long licorice laces, halted near him, gaping at his stump with their yellow slobbered mouths. He swung himself forward in vigorous jerks, halted, lifted his head towards a window and bayed deeply, home and beauty. The gay sweet chirping whistling within went on a bar or two, ceased. The blind of the window was drawn aside. A card unfurnished apartment slipped from the sash and fell. A plump bare generous arm shone, was seen, held forth from a white petticoat bodice and taut shift straps. A woman's hand flung forth a coin over the area railings. It fell on the path. One of the urchins ran to it, picked it up and dropped it into the minstrel's cap, saying, There, sir. Katie and Booty Daedalus shoved in the door of the closest steaming kitchen. Did you put in the books? Booty asked. Maggie at the range rammed down a grayish mass beneath bubbling suds twice with her pot stick and wiped her brow. They wouldn't give anything on them, she said. Father Conmi walked through Klongo's fields, his thin-socked ankles tickled by stubble. Where did you try? Booty asked. Guinnesses. Booty stamped her foot and threw her satchel on the table. Bad cess to her big face. She cried. Katie went to the range and peered with squinting eyes. What's in the pot? She asked. Shirts, Maggie said. Booty cried angrily, Cricky, is there nothing for us to eat? 
Katie, lifting the kettle lid in a pad of her stained skirt, asked, and what's in this? A heavy fume gushed in answer. Pea soup, Maggie said. Where did you get it? Katie asked. Sister Mary Patrick, Maggie said. The lackey rang his bell. Barong. Booty sat down at the table and said hungrily, give us it here. Maggie poured yellow thick soup from the kettle into a bowl. Katie, sitting opposite Booty, said quietly, as her fingertip lifted to her mouth random crumbs, a good job we have that much. Where's Dilly? Gone to meet father, Maggie said. Booty, breaking big chunks of bread into the yellow soup, added, our father who art not in heaven. Maggie, pouring yellow soup in Katie's bowl, exclaimed, Booty. For shame. A skiff, a crumpled throwaway, Elijah is coming, rowed lightly down the Liffey, under Luplin Bridge, shooting the rapids where water chafed around the bridge piers, sailing eastward past hulls and anchor chains, between the Custom House Old Dock and George's Quay. The blonde girl in Thornton's bedded the wicker basket with rustling fiber. Blazes Boylan handed her the bottle swathed in pink tissue paper and a small jar. Put these in first, will you? He said. Yes, sir, the blonde girl said. And the fruit on top. That'll do, game ball, Blazes Boylan said. She bestowed fat pears neatly, head by tail, and among them ripe shame-faced peaches. Blazes Boylan walked here and there in new tan shoes about the fruit-smelling shop, lifting fruits, young juicy crinkled and plump red tomatoes, sniffing smells. H. E. L. Wise filed before him, tall white-hatted, past Tangier Lane, plodding towards their goal. He turned suddenly from a chip of strawberries, drew a gold watch from his fob and held it at its chain's length. Can you send them by tram? Now? A dark-backed figure under Merchant's Arch scanned books on the hawker's cart. Certainly, sir. Is it in the city? Oh, yes, Blazes Boylan said. Ten minutes. The blonde girl handed him a docket and pencil. Will you write the address, sir? Blazes Boylan at the counter wrote and pushed the docket to her. Send it at once, will you? He said. It's for an invalid. Yes, sir. I will, sir. Blazes Boylan rattled Mary money in his trousers pocket. What's the damage? He asked. The blonde girl's slim fingers reckoned the fruits. Blazes Boylan looked into the cut of her blouse. A young pullet. He took a red carnation from the tall steam glass. This for me? He asked gallantly. The blonde girl glanced sideways at him, got up regardless, with his tie a bit crooked, blushing. Yes, sir, she said. Bending archly she reckoned again fat pears and blushing peaches. Blazes Boylan looked in her blouse with more favor, the stalk of the red flower between his smiling teeth. May I say a word to your telephone, missy? He asked roguishly. Ma! All might know Artifoni said. He gazed over Stephen's shoulder at Goldsmith's knobby pole. Two carfuls of tourists passed slowly, their women sitting four, gripping the handrests. Pale faces. Men's arms frankly round their stunted forms. They looked from Trinity to the blind columned porch of the Bank of Ireland where pigeons ru cuckooed. Ankyo ho avuto di questi day, all might know Artifoni said, con uro giovine cum lei. Epoi mi sono convindo che il mondo e unibestia. Ipicato. Perché la sua voce. Sarebbe un cespit di rendita, via. In vece, le si sacrifica. Sacrificio in cruento, Stephen said smiling, swaying his ash plant in slow swing swung from its midpoint, lightly. Spriamo, the round mustachioed face said pleasantly. Ma, dia reta a me. Si rifletta. By the stern stone hand of Gratin, bidding halt, an inchicore tram unloaded straggling highland soldiers of a band. See rifle Turo, Stephen said, glancing down the solid trouser leg. Ma, sul serio, eh? All might know Artifoni said. His heavy hand took Stephen's firmly. Human eyes. They gazed curiously an instant and turned quickly towards a dalky tram. Ecolo, all might know Artifoni said in friendly haste. Venga a travarmi e si pensi. Adio, caro. Arrivederla, maestro, Stephen said, raising his hat when his hand was freed. E grazie. Dice? All might know Artifoni said. Scusi, eh? Tanta bel cos. All might know Artifoni, holding up a baton of rolled music as a signal, trotted on stout trousers after the donkey tram. In vain he trotted, signaling in vain among the rout of Bernied Gilly's smuggling implements of music through Trinity Gates. Miss Dunn hid the Capel Street Library copy of the woman in white far back in her drawer and rolled a sheet of gaudy notepaper into her typewriter. 
Too much mystery business in it. Is he in love with that one, Marion? Change it and get another by Mary Cecil Hay. The disc shot down the groove, wobbled a while, ceased and ogled them. 6. Miss Dunn clicked on the keyboard, June 16, 1904. Five tall white-hatted sandwichmen between Monopony's corner and the slab where Wolf Tone's statue was not, yield themselves turning H. E. L. Wise and plodded back as they had come. Then she stared at the large poster of Marie Kendall, charming soubrette, and, listlessly lolling, scribbled on the jotter 16s and capital S's. Mustard hair and dauby cheeks. She's not nice looking, is she? The way she's holding up her bit of a skirt. Wonder will that fellow be at the band tonight? If I could get that dressmaker to make a concertina skirt like Susie Nagel's. They kick out grand. Shannon and all the boat club swells never took his eyes off her. Hope to goodness he won't keep me here till seven. The telephone rang rudely by her ear. Hello? Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, sir. I'll ring them up after five. Only those two, sir, for Belfast and Liverpool. All right, sir. Then I can go after six if you're not back. A quarter after. Yes, sir. Twenty-seven and six. I'll tell him. Yes, one, seven, six. She scribbled three figures on an envelope. Mr. Boylan. Hello. That gentleman from sport was in looking for you. Mr. Lenahan, yes. He said he'll be in the Ormond at four. No, sir. Yes, sir. I'll ring them up after five. Two pink faces turned in the flare of the tiny torch. Who's that? Ned Lambert asked. Is that Crotty? Ring a Bella and Crosshaven, a voice replied groping for foothold. Hello, Jack, is that yourself? Ned Lambert said, raising in salute his pliant lath among the flickering arches. Come on. Mind your steps there. The Vesta in the clergyman's uplifted hand consumed itself in a long soft flame and was let fall. At their feet its red speck died, and moldy air closed round them. How interesting. A refined accent said in the gloom. Yes, sir, Ned Lambert said heartily. We are standing in the historic council chamber of St. Mary's Abbey where Silk and Thomas proclaimed himself a rebel in 1534. This is the most historic spot in all Dublin. O'Madden Burke is going to write something about it one of these days. The old Bank of Ireland was over the way till the time of the Union and the original Jews' temple was here too before they built their synagogue over in Adelaide Road. You were never here before, Jack, were you? No, Ned. He rode down through Dame Walk, the refined accent said, if my memory serves me. The mansion of the Kildares was in Thomas Court. That's right, Ned Lambert said. That's quite right, sir. If you will be so kind then, the clergyman said, the next time to allow me perhaps. Certainly, Ned Lambert said. Bring the camera whenever you like. I'll get those bags cleared away from the windows. You can take it from here or from here. In the still faint light he moved about, tapping with his lath the piled seed bags and points of vantage on the floor. From a long face a beard and gaze hung on a chessboard. I'm deeply obliged, Mr. Lambert, the clergyman said. I won't trespass on your valuable time. You're welcome, sir, Ned Lambert said. Drop in whenever you like. Next week, say. Can you see? Yes, yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Lambert. Very pleased to have met you. Pleasure is mine, sir, Ned Lambert answered. He followed his guest to the outlet and then whirled his lath away among the pillars. With J. J. O'Malloy he came forth slowly into Mary's Abbey where Draymond were loading floats with sacks of carob and palm nut meal, O'Connor, Wexford. He stood to read the card in his hand. The Reverend you see love, Rath Coffee. Present address, St. Michael's, Salins. Nice young chap he is. He's writing a book about the Fitzgeralds he told me. He's well up in history, faith. The young woman with slow care detached from her light skirt a clinging twig. I thought you were at a new gunpowder plot, J. J. O'Malloy said. Ned Lambert cracked his fingers in the air. God! He cried. I forgot to tell him that one about the Earl of Kildare after he set fire to Cashel Cathedral. You know that one? I'm bloody sorry I did it, says he, but I declare to God I thought the Archbishop was inside. He mightn't like it, though. What? God, I'll tell him anyhow. That was the great Earl, the Fitzgerald Moore. Hot members they were all of them, the Geraldines. The horses he passed started nervously under their slack harness. He slapped a piebald haunch quivering near him and cried, Whoa, Sonny. He turned to Jay. Jay, O'Malloy and asked, 
Well, Jack. What is it? What's the trouble? Wait a while. Hold hard. With gaping mouth and head far back he stood still and, after an instant, sneezed loudly. Chow. He said. Blast you. The dust from those sacks, J. J. Oh Malloy said politely. No, Ned Lambert gasped, I caught a. Cold night before. Blast your soul. Night before last. And there was a hell of a lot of draft. He held his handkerchief ready for the coming. I was. Glasnevin this morning. Poor little. What do you call him? Chow. Mother of Moses. Tom Rochford took the top disc from the pile he clasped against his claret waistcoat. See? He said. Say it's turn six. In here, see. Turn now on. He slid it into the left slot for them. It shot down the groove, wobbled a while, ceased, ogling them. Six. Lawyers of the past, haughty, pleading, beheld pass from the consolidated taxing office to Nysai Prius Court Richie Goulding carrying the coast bag of Goulding, Collis and Ward and heard rustling from the Admiralty Division of King's Bench to the Court of Appeal an elderly female with false teeth smiling incredulously and a black silk skirt of great amplitude. See? He said. See now the last one I put in is over here, turns over. The impact. Leverage, see? He showed them the rising column of discs on the right. Smart idea, Nosy Flynn said, snuffling. So a fellow coming in late can see what turn is on and what turns are over. See? Tom Rochford said. He slid in a disc for himself, and watched it shoot, wobble, ogle, stop, four. Turn now on. I'll see him now in the Ormond, Lenahan said, and sound him. One good turn deserves another. Do, Tom Rochford said. Tell him I'm boiling with impatience. Good night, McCoy said abruptly. When you two begin. Nosy Flynn stooped towards the lever, snuffling at it. But how does it work here, Tommy? He asked. Turalu, Lenahan said. See you later. He followed McCoy out across the tiny square of Crampton Court. He's a hero, he said simply. I know, McCoy said. The drain, you mean? Drain? Lenahan said. It was down a manhole. They passed Dan Lowry's music hall where Marie Kendall, charming soubrette, smiled on them from a poster a dobby smile. Going down the path of Sycamore Street beside the Empire Music Hall Lenahan showed McCoy how the whole thing was. One of those manholes like a bloody gas pipe and there was the poor devil stuck down in it, half choked with sewer gas. Down went Tom Rochford anyhow, bookie's vest and all, with a rope round him. And be damned but he got the rope round the poor devil and the two were hauled up. The act of a hero, he said. At the Dolphin they halted to allow the ambulance car to gallop past them for Jervis Street. This way, he said, walking to the right. I want to pop into Linham's to see Scepter's starting price. What's the time by your gold watch and chain? McCoy peered into Marcus Tertius Moses' somber office, then at O'Neill's clock. After three, he said. Who's riding her? Oh Madden, Lenahan said. And a game filly she is. While he waited in Temple Bar McCoy dodged a banana peel with gentle pushes of his toe from the path to the gutter. Fellow might damn easy get a nasty fall there coming along tight in the dark. The gates of the drive opened wide to give egress to the vice-regal cavalcade. Even money, Lenahan said returning. I knocked against bantam lions and they're going to back a bloody horse someone gave him that hasn't an earthly. Through here. They went up the steps and under Merchant's Arch. A dark back figure scanned books on the hawker's cart. There he is, Lenahan said. Wonder what he's buying, McCoy said, glancing behind. Leopoldo or the bloom is on the rye, Lenahan said. He's dead nuts on sales, McCoy said. I was with him one day and he bought a book from an old one in Liffey Street for two bob. There were fine plates in it worth double the money, the stars and the moon and comets with long tails. Astronomy it was about. Lenahan laughed. I'll tell you a damn good one about comets tails, he said. Come over in the sun. They crossed to the metal bridge and went along Wellington Quay by the river wall. Master Patrick Aloysius Dignam came out of Mangan's, late Ferenbox, carrying a pound and a half of pork steaks. There was a long spread out at Glen Cree Reformatory, Lenahan said eagerly. The annual dinner, you know. Boiled shirt affair. The Lord Mayor was there, Val Dillon it was, and Sir Charles Cameron and Dan Dawson spoke and there was music. Bartell Darcy sang and Benjamin Dolar. I know, McCoy broke in. My missus sang there once. Did she? Lenahan said. A card on furnished apartments reappeared on the window sash of number 7 Eccles Street. 
He checked his tail a moment but broke out in a wheezy laugh. But wait till I tell you, he said. Delahant of Camden Street had the catering and yours truly was chief bottle washer. Bloom and the wife were there. Lashings of stuff we put up, port wine and sherry and curacoa to which we did ample justice. Fast and furious it was. After liquids came solids. Cold joints galore and mince pies. I know, McCoy said. The year the missus was there. Lenahan linked his arm warmly. But wait till I tell you, he said. We had a midnight lunch too after all the jollification and when we sallied forth it was blue o'clock the morning after the night before. Coming home it was a gorgeous winter's night on the Featherbed Mountain. Bloom and Chris Callanan were on one side of the car and I was with the wife on the other. We started singing glees and duets, Lo, the early beam of morning. She was well primed with a good load of Delahant's port under her belly band. Every jolt the bloody car gave I had her bumping up against me. Hell's delights. She has a fine pair, God bless her. Like that. He held his caved hands a cubit from him, frowning, I was tucking the rug under her and settling her bow all the time. Know what I mean? His hands molded ample curves of air. He shut his eyes tight in delight, his body shrinking, and blew a sweet chirp from his lips. The lad stood to attention anyhow, he said with a sigh. She's a gamey mare and no mistake. Bloom was pointing out all the stars and the comets in the heavens to Chris Callanan and the Jarvie, the Great Bear and Hercules and the Dragon, and the whole Jingbang lot. But, by God, I was lost, so to speak, in the Milky Way. He knows them all, faith. At last she spotted a weenie wishy one miles away. And what star is that, Paldi? Says she. By God, she had Bloom cornered. That one, is it? Says Chris Callanan, sure that's only what you might call a pinprick. By God, he wasn't far wide of the mark. Lenahan stopped and leaned on the river wall, panting with soft laughter. I'm weak, he gasped. McCoy's white face smiled about it at instants and grew grave. Lenahan walked on again. He lifted his yachting cap and scratched his hindhead rapidly. He glanced sideways in the sunlight at McCoy. He's a cultured all round man, Bloom is, he said seriously. He's not one of your common or garden. You know. There's a touch of the artist about old Bloom. Mr. Bloom turned over idly pages of the awful disclosures of Maria Monk, then of Aristotle's masterpiece. Crooked botched print. Plates, infants cuddled in a ball in bloodred wombs like livers of slaughtered cows. Lots of them like that at this moment all over the world. All butting with their skulls to get out of it. Child born every minute somewhere. Mrs. Purefoy. He laid both books aside and glanced at the third, Tales of the Ghetto by Leopold von Sacher Mazok. That I had, he said, pushing it by. The shopman let two volumes fall on the counter. Them are two good ones, he said. Onions of his breath came across the counter out of his ruined mouth. He bent to make a bundle of the other books, hugged them against his unbuttoned waistcoat and bore them off behind the dingy curtain. On O'Connell Bridge many persons observed the grave deportment and gay apparel of Mr. Dennis J. Maginney, professor of dancing and sea. Mr. Bloom, alone, looked at the titles. Fair Tyrants by James Love Birch. Know the kind that is. Had it? Yes. He opened it. Thought so. A woman's voice behind the dingy curtain. Listen, the man. No, she wouldn't like that much. Got her at once. He read the other title, Sweets of Sin. More in her line. Let us see. He read where his finger opened. All the dollar bills her husband gave her were spent in the stores on wondrous gowns and costliest frillies. For him. For Raoul. Yes. This. Here. Try. Her mouth glued on his in a luscious voluptuous kiss while his hands felt for the opulent curves inside her dazabile. Yes. Take this. The end. You are late, he spoke hoarsely, eyeing her with a suspicious glare. The beautiful woman threw off her sable-trimmed wrap, displaying her queenly shoulders and heaving him bone point. An imperceptible smile played round her perfect lips as she turned to him calmly. Mr. Bloom read again, the beautiful woman. Warmth showered gently over him, cowing his flesh. Flesh yielded amply amid rumpled clothes, whites of eyes swooning up. His nostrils arched themselves for prey. Melting breast ointments, for him. For Raoul. Armpits oniony sweat. Fish gluey slime, her heaving in bone point. Feel. Press. Krisht. Sulfur dung of lions. Young. Young. An elderly female, no more young, left the building of the courts of chancery, king's bench, exchequer and common pleas, having heard in the Lord Chancellor's court the case in lunacy of Potterton, 
in the Admiralty Division the summons, ex part motion, of the owners of the Lady Cairns versus the owners of the Bark Mona, in the Court of Appeal Reservation of Judgment in the case of Harvey versus the Ocean Accident and Guarantee Corporation. Flemmy Cough shook the air of the bookshop, bulging out the dingy curtains. The shopman's uncombed grey head came out in his unshaven reddened face, coughing. He raked his throat rudely, puked phlegm on the floor. He put his boot on what he had spat, wiping his soul along it, and bent, showing a raw skin crown, scantily haired. Mr. Bloom beheld it. Mastering his troubled breath, he said, I'll take this one. The shopman lifted eyes bleared with old room. Sweets of sin, he said, tapping on it. That's a good one. The lackey by the door of Dylan's auction room shook his handbell twice again and viewed himself in the chalked mirror of the cabinet. Dilly Dedalus, loitering by the curbstone, heard the beats of the bell, the cries of the auctioneer within. Four and nine. Those lovely curtains. Five shillings. Cozy curtains. Selling new at two guineas. Any advance on five shillings? Going for five shillings. The lackey lifted his handbell and shook it, barong. Bang of the last lap bell spurred the half-mile wheelmen to their sprint. J. A. Jackson, W. E. Wiley, A. Monroe and H. T. Gahan, their stretched necks wagging, negotiated the curve by the college library. Mr. Dedalus, tugging a long mustache, came round from Williams's row. He halted near his daughter. It's time for you, she said. Stand up straight for the love of the Lord Jesus, Mr. Dedalus said. Are you trying to imitate your Uncle John, the cornet player, head upon shoulder? Melancholy God. Dilly shrugged her shoulders. Mr. Dedalus placed his hands on them and held them back. Stand up straight, girl, he said. You'll get curvature of the spine. Do you know what you look like? He let his head sink suddenly down and forward, hunching his shoulders and dropping his under jaw. Give it up, father, Dilly said. All the people are looking at you. Mr. Dedalus drew himself upright and tugged again at his mustache. Did you get any money? Dilly asked. Where would I get money? Mr. Dedalus said. There is no one in Dublin would lend me fourpence. You got some, Dilly said, looking in his eyes. How do you know that? Mr. Dedalus asked, his tongue in his cheek. Mr. Kernan, pleased with the order he had booked, walked boldly along James's street. I know you did, Dilly answered. Were you in the Scotch house now? I was not, then, Mr. Dedalus said, smiling. Was it the little nuns taught you to be so saucy? Here. He handed her a shilling. See if you can do anything with that, he said. I suppose you got five, Dilly said. Give me more than that. Wait a while, Mr. Dedalus said threateningly. You're like the rest of them, are you? An insolent pack of little bitches since your poor mother died. But wait a while. You'll all get a short shrift and a long day from me. Low blaggardism. I'm going to get rid of you. Wouldn't care if I was stretched out stiff. He's dead. The man upstairs is dead. He left her and walked on. Dilly followed quickly and pulled his coat. Well, what is it? He said, stopping. The lackey rang his bell behind their backs. Barong. Curse your bloody blatant soul, Mr. Dedalus cried, turning on him. The lackey, aware of comment, shook the lolling clapper of his bell but feebly, bang. Mr. Dedalus stared at him. Watch him, he said. It's instructive. I wonder will he allow us to talk. You got more than that? Father, Dilly said. I'm going to show you a little trick, Mr. Dedalus said. I'll leave you all where Jesus left the Jews. Look, there's all I have. I got two shillings from Jack Power and I spent tuppence for a shave for the funeral. He drew forth a handful of copper coins, nervously. Can't you look for some money somewhere? Dilly said. Mr. Dedalus thought and nodded. I will, he said gravely. I looked all along the gutter in O'Connell Street. I'll try this one now. You're very funny, Dilly said, grinning. Here, Mr. Dedalus said, handing her two pennies. Get a glass of milk for yourself and a bun or a something. I'll be home shortly. He put the other coins in his pocket and started to walk on. The viceregal cavalcade passed, greeted by obsequious policemen, out of Parkgate. I'm sure you have another shilling, Dilly said. The lackey banged loudly. Mr. Dedalus amid the din walked off, murmuring to himself with a pursing mincing mouth gently the little nuns. Nice little things. Oh, sure they wouldn't do anything. Oh, sure they wouldn't really. Is it little sister Monica? From the sundial towards James's gate walked Mr. Kernan, pleased with the order he had booked for Polbrook Robertson, boldly along James's street, past Shackleton's offices. 
Got round him all right. How do you do, Mr. Crimmins? First rate, sir. I was afraid you might be up in your other establishment in Pimlico. How are things going? Just keeping alive. Lovely weather we're having. Yes, indeed. Good for the country. Those farmers are always grumbling. I'll just take a thimbleful of your best gin, Mr. Crimmins. A small gin, sir. Yes, sir. Terrible affair that General Slocum explosion. Terrible, terrible. A thousand casualties. And heartrending scenes. Men trampling down women and children. Most brutal thing. What did they say was the cause? Spontaneous combustion. Most scandalous revelation. Not a single lifeboat would float and the fire hose all burst. What I can't understand is how the inspectors ever allowed a boat like that. Now, you're talking straight, Mr. Crimmins. You know why? Palm oil. Is that a fact? Without a doubt. Well now, look at that. And America they say is the land of the free. I thought we were bad here. I smiled at him. America, I said quietly, just like that. What is it? The sweepings of every country including our own. Isn't that true? That's a fact. Graft, my dear sir. Well, of course, where there's money going there's always someone to pick it up. Saw him looking at my frock coat. Dress does it. Nothing like a dressy appearance. Bowls them over. Hello, Simon, Father Cowley said. How are things? Hello, Bob, old man, Mr. Dedalus answered, stopping. Mr. Kernan halted and preened himself before the sloping mirror of Peter Kennedy, hairdresser. Stylish coat, beyond a doubt. Scott of Dawson Street. Well worth the half sovereign I gave Neary for it. Never built under three guineas. Fits me down to the ground. Some Kildare Street Club toff had it probably. John Mulligan, the manager of the Hibernian Bank, gave me a very sharp eye yesterday on Carlisle Bridge as if he remembered me. Ahem. Um, must dress the character for those fellows. Knight of the Road. Gentlemen. And now, Mr. Crimmins, may we have the honor of your custom again, sir. The cup that cheers but not inebriates, as the old saying has it. North Wall and Sir John Rogerson's Key, with hulls and anchor chains, sailing westward, sailed by a skiff, a crumpled throwaway, rocked on the ferry wash, Elijah is coming. Mr. Kernan glanced in farewell at his image. High color, of course. Grizzled mustache. Returned Indian officer. Bravely he bore his stumpy body forward on spatted feet, squaring his shoulders. Is that Ned Lambert's brother over the way, Sam? What? Yes. He's as like it as damn it. No. The windscreen of that motor car in the sun there. Just a flash like that. Damn like him. Ahem. Uh-huh. Hot spirit of juniper juice warmed his vitals and his breath. Good drop of gin, that was. His frocktails winked in bright sunshine to his fat strut. Down there Emmett was hanged, drawn and quartered. Greasy black rope. Dogs licking the blood off the street when the Lord Lieutenant's wife drove by in her naughty. Bad times those were. Well, well. Over and done with. Great topers too. Four bottle men. Let me see. Is he buried in St. Mikan's? Or no, there was a midnight burial in Glasnevin. Corpse brought in through a secret door in the wall. Dignam is there now. One out in a puff. Well, well. Better turn down here. Make a detour. Mr. Kernan turned and walked down the slope of Watling Street by the corner of Guinness's visitor's waiting room. Outside the Dublin Distillers Company stores an outside car without fare or Jarvie stood, the reins nodded to the wheel. Damn dangerous thing. Some Tipperary boss June endangering the lives of the citizens. Runaway horse. Dennis Breen with his tomes, weary of having waited an hour in John Henry Mantone's office, led his wife over O'Connell Bridge, bound for the office of Messrs. Collis and Ward. Mr. Kernan approached Island Street. Times of the Troubles. Must ask Ned Lambert to lend me those reminiscences of Sir Jonah Barrington. When you look back on it all now in a kind of retrospective arrangement. Gaming at Daly's. No card sharping then. One of those fellows got his hand nailed to the table by a dagger. Somewhere here Lord Edward Fitzgerald escaped from Major Sir. Stables behind Moira House. Damn good gin that was. Fine dashing young nobleman. Good stock, of course. That ruffian, that sham squire, with his violet gloves gave him away. Course they were on the wrong side. They rose in dark and evil days. Fine poem that is, Ingram. They were gentlemen. Ben Delar does sing that ballad touchingly. Masterly rendition. 
At the siege of Ross did my father fall. A cavalcade and easy trot along Pembroke Key passed, outriders leaping, leaping in there, in their saddles. Frock coats. Cream sunshades. Mr. Kernan hurried forward, blowing pursily. His Excellency. Too bad. Just missed that by a hair. Damn it. What a pity. Stephen Dedalus watched through the webbed window the lapidary's fingers prove a timed old chain. Dust webbed the window in the shot rays. Dust darkened the toiling fingers with their vulture nails. Dust slept on dull coils of bronze and silver, lozenges of cinnabar, on rubies, leprous and winna dark stones. Born all in the dark wormy earth, cold specks of fire, evil, lights shining in the darkness. Where fallen archangels flung the stars of their brows. Muddy swine snouts, hands, root and root, gripe and rest them. She dances in a foul gloom where gum bums with garlic. A sailor man, rust bearded, sips from a beaker rum and eyes her. A long and seaf silent rut. She dances, capers, wagging her sewish haunches and her hips, on her gross belly flapping a ruby egg. Old Russell with a smeared chamois rag burnished again his gem, turned it and held it at the point of his Moses beard. Grandfather ape gloating on a stolen hoard. And you who rest old images from the burial earth? The brainsick words of sophists, Antisthenes. A lore of drugs. Orient and immortal wheat standing from everlasting to everlasting. Two old women fresh from their whiff of the briny trudged through Irish town along London Bridge Road, one with a sanded tired umbrella, one with a midwife's bag in which eleven cockles rolled. The whir of flapping leathern bands and hum of dynamos from the powerhouse urged Stephen to be on. Beingless beings. Stop. Throb always without you and the throb always within. Your heart you sing of. I between them. Where? Between two roaring worlds where they swirl, I shatter them, one and both. But stun myself too in the blow. Shatter me you who can. Baud and butcher were the words. I say. Not yet a while. A look around. Yes, quite true. Very large and wonderful and keeps famous time. You say right, sir. A Monday morning, twas so, indeed. Stephen went down Bedford Row, the handle of the ash clacking against his shoulder blade. In Cloacy's window a faded 1860 print of Heenan boxing sayers held his eye. Staring backers with square hats stood round the rope prize ring. The heavyweights in tight loincloths propose gently each to other as bulbous fists. And they are throbbing, heroes' hearts. He turned and halted by the slanted book cart. Tuppence each, the huckster said. Four for sixpence. Tattered pages. The Irish beekeeper. Life and miracles of the Correa of ours. Pocket guide to Killarney. I might find here one of my pawn school prizes. Stefano Dedalo, alumno optimo, palmum ferenti. Father Conmi, having read his little hours, walked through the hamlet of Donny Carney, murmuring vespers. Binding too good probably. What is this? Eighth and Ninth Book of Moses. Secret of all secrets. Seal of King David. Thumbed pages, read and read. Who has passed here before me? How to soften chapped hands. Recipe for white wine vinegar. How to win a woman's love. For me this. Say the following talisman three times with hands folded. Say el yilo nebricata femininum. Amor me solo. Sanctus. Amen. Who wrote this? Charms and invocations of the most blessed abbot Peter Solanka to all true believers divulged. As good as any other abbot's charms, as mumbling Joachim's. Down, bald eye noddle, or will wool your wool. What are you doing here, Stephen? Dilly's high shoulders and shabby dress. Shut the book quick. Don't let see. What are you doing? Stephen said. A Stuart face of none such Charles, lank locks falling at its sides. It glowed as she crouched feeding the fire with broken boots. I told her of Paris. Late lived under a quilt of old overcoats, fingering a pinchbeck bracelet, Dan Kelly's token. Nibricata femininum. What have you there? Stephen asked. I bought it from the other cart for a penny, Dilly said, laughing nervously. Is it any good? My eyes they say she has. Do others see me so? Quick, far and daring. Shadow of my mind. He took the coverless book from her hand. Chardinal's French primer. What did you buy that for? He asked. To learn French? She nodded, reddening and closing tight her lips. Show no surprise. Quite natural. Here, Stephen said. It's all right. Mind Maggie doesn't pawn it on you. I suppose all my books are gone. Some, Dilly said. We had two. She is drowning. Agent bite. Save her. Agent bite. 
all against us. She will drown me with her, eyes and hair. Lank coils of seaweed hair around me, my heart, my soul. Salt green death. We. Agent bite of Inwit. Inwit's agent bite. Misery. Misery. Hello, Simon, Father Cowley said. How are things? Hello, Bob, old man, Mr. Dedalus answered, stopping. They clasped hands loudly outside Reddy and daughters. Father Cowley brushed his mustache off and downward with a scooping hand. What's the best news? Mr. Dedalus said. Why then not much, Father Cowley said. I'm barricaded up, Simon, with two men prowling around the house trying to effect an entrance. Jolly, Mr. Dedalus said. Who is it? Oh, Father Cowley said. A certain Gombean man of our acquaintance. With a broken back, is it? Mr. Dedalus asked. The same, Simon, Father Cowley answered. Reuben of that ilk. I'm just waiting for Ben Dolar. He's going to say a word to Long John to get him to take those two men off. All I want is a little time. He looked with vague hope up and down the key, a big apple bulging in his neck. I know, Mr. Dedalus said, nodding. Poor old Bockety Ben. He's always doing a good turn for someone. Hold hard. He put on his glasses and gazed towards the metal bridge an instant. There he is, by God, he said, arson pockets. Ben Delar's loose blue cutaway and square hat above large slops crossed the key and full gate from the metal bridge. He came towards them at an amble, scratching actively behind his coattails. As he came near Mr. Dedalus greeted, hold that fellow with the bad trousers. Hold him now, Ben Delar said. Mr. Dedalus eyed with cold wandering scorn various points of Ben Delar's figure. Then, turning to Father Cowley with a nod, he muttered sneeringly, that's a pretty garment, isn't it, for a summer's day? Why? God eternally curse your soul, Ben Delar growled furiously, I threw out more clothes in my time than you ever saw. He stood beside them beaming, on them first and on his roomy clothes from points of which Mr. Dedalus flicked fluff, saying, they were made for a man in his health, Ben, anyhow. Bad luck to the Juman that made them, Ben Delar said. Thanks be to God he's not paid yet. And how is that basso profondo, Benjamin? Father Cowley asked. Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdall Farrell, murmuring, glassy-eyed, strode past the Kildare Street Club. Ben Delar frowned and, making suddenly a chanter's mouth, gave forth a deep note. Ah! He said. That's the style, Mr. Dedalus said, nodding to its drone. What about that? Ben Delar said. Not too dusty? What? He turned to both. That'll do, Father Cowley said, nodding also. The Reverend Hugh C. Love walked from the old chapter house of St. Mary's Abbey past James and Charles Kennedy's, rectifiers, attended by Geraldine's tall and personable, towards the Thalzel beyond the fort of hurdles. Ben Delar with a heavy list towards the shop fronts led them forward, his joyful fingers in the air. Come along with me to the sub-sheriff's office, he said. I want to show you the new beauty Rock has for a bailiff. He's a cross between Labengula and Lynchon. He's well worth seeing, mind you. Come along. I saw John Henry Mentone casually in the bodega just now and it will cost me a fall if I don't. Wait a while. We're on the right lay, Bob, believe you me. For a few days tell him, Father Cowley said anxiously. Ben Delar halted and stared, his loud orifice open, a dangling button of his coat wagging bright back from its thread as he wiped away the heavy shrouds that clogged his eyes to hear a right. What few days? He boomed. Hasn't your landlord distrained for rent? He has, Father Cowley said. Then our friend's writ is not worth the paper it's printed on, Ben Delar said. The landlord has the prior claim. I gave him all the particulars. 29 Windsor Avenue. Love is the name? That's right, Father Cowley said. The Reverend Mr. Love. He's a minister in the country somewhere. But are you sure of that? You can tell Barabbas from me, Ben Delar said, that he can put that writ where Jacko put the nuts. He led Father Cowley boldly forward, linked to his bulk. Filberts I believe they were, Mr. Dedalus said, as he dropped his glasses on his coat front, following them. The youngster will be all right, Martin Cunningham said, as they passed out of the castle yard gate. The policeman touched his forehead. God bless you, Martin Cunningham said, cheerily. He signed to the waiting Jarvie who chucked at the reins and set on towards Lord Edward Street. Bronze by gold, Miss Kennedy's head by Miss Deuce's head, appeared above the cross blind of the Ormond Hotel. Yes, Martin Cunningham said, fingering his beard. I wrote to Father Conmy and laid the whole case before him. You could try our friend, Mr. Power suggested backward. Boyd? 
Martin Cunningham said shortly. Touch me not. John Wise Nolan, lagging behind, reading the list, came after them quickly down Cork Hill. On the steps of the City Hall Councillor Nanetti, descending, hailed Alderman Cowley and Councillor Abraham Lyon ascending. The castle car wheeled empty into Upper Exchange Street. Look here, Martin, John Wise Nolan said, overtaking them at the mail office. I see Bloom put his name down for five shillings. Quite right, Martin Cunningham said, taking the list. And put down the five shillings too. Without a second word either, Mr. Power said. Strange but true, Martin Cunningham added. John Wise Nolan opened wide eyes. I'll say there is much kindness in the Jew, he quoted, elegantly. They went down Parliament Street. There's Jimmy Henry, Mr. Power said, just heading for Kavanaugh's. Righto, Martin Cunningham said. Here goes. Outside La Maison Claire Blazes Boylan waylaid Jack Mooney's brother-in-law, humpy, tight, making for the liberties. John Wise Nolan fell back with Mr. Power, while Martin Cunningham took the elbow of a dapper little man in a shower of hail suit, who walked uncertainly, with hasty steps past Mickey Anderson's watches. The assistant town clerk's corns are giving him some trouble, John Wise Nolan told Mr. Power. They followed round the corner towards James Cavanaugh's wine rooms. The empty castle car fronted them at rest in Essex Gate. Martin Cunningham, speaking always, showed off in the list at which Jimmy Henry did not glance. And Long John Fanning is here too, John Wise Nolan said, as large as life. The tall form of Long John Fanning filled the doorway where he stood. Good day, Mr. Subsheriff, Martin Cunningham said, as all halted and greeted. Long John Fanning made no way for them. He removed his large Henry Clay decisively and his large fierce eyes scowled intelligently over all their faces. Are the conscript fathers pursuing their peaceful deliberations? He said with rich acrid utterance to the assistant town clerk. Hell open to Christians they were having, Jimmy Henry said pettishly, about their damned Irish language. Where was the marshal, he wanted to know, to keep order in the council chamber. And old Barlow the Maccabearer laid up with asthma, no mace on the table, nothing in order, no quorum even, and Hutchinson, the Lord Mayor, inland did know and little Lorcan Sherlock doing locum tenens for him. Damned Irish language, language of our forefathers. Long John Fanning blew a plume of smoke from his lips. Martin Cunningham spoke by turns, twirling the peak of his beard, to the assistant town clerk and the sub-sheriff, while John Wise Nolan held his peace. What dignum was that? Long John Fanning asked. Jimmy Henry made a grimace and lifted his left foot. Oh, my corns. He said plaintively. Come upstairs for goodness sake till I sit down somewhere. Oof. Ooh. Mind. Testily he made room for himself beside Long John Fanning's flank and passed in and up the stairs. Come on up, Martin Cunningham said to the sub-sheriff. I don't think you knew him or perhaps you did, though. With John Wise Nolan Mr. Power followed them in. Decent little soul he was, Mr. Power said to the stalwart back of Long John Fanning ascending towards Long John Fanning in the mirror. Rather low-sized. Dignum of Mentone's office that was, Martin Cunningham said. Long John Fanning could not remember him. Clatter of horse hoofs sounded from the air. What's that? Martin Cunningham said. All turned where they stood. John Wise Nolan came down again. From the cool shadow of the doorway he saw the horses pass Parliament Street, harness and glossy pasterns in sunlight shimmering. Gaily they went past before his cool unfriendly eyes, not quickly. In saddles of the leaders, leaping leaders, rode outriders. What was it? Martin Cunningham asked, as they went on up the staircase. The Lord Lieutenant General and General Governor of Ireland, John Wise Nolan answered from the stairfoot. As they trot across the thick carpet Buck Mulligan whispered behind his Panama to Haynes, Parnell's brother. They're in the corner. They chose a small table near the window, opposite a long-faced man whose beard and gaze hung intently down on a chessboard. Is that he? Haynes asked, twisting round in his seat. Yes, Mulligan said. That's John Howard, his brother, our city marshal. John Howard Parnell translated a white bishop quietly and his grey claw went up again to his forehead where it rested. An instant after, under its screen, his eyes looked quickly, ghost-bright, at his foe and fell once more upon a working corner. I'll take a melange, Haynes said to the waitress. Two melanges, Buck Mulligan said. And bring us some scones and butter and some cakes as well. When she had gone he said, laughing, we call it DBC because they have damn bad cakes. Oh, but you miss Daedalus on Hamlet. Haynes opened his new-bought book. I'm sorry, he said. Shakespeare is the happy hunting ground of all minds that have lost their balance. 
the one-legged sailor growled at the area of 14 Nelson Street, England expects. Buck Mulligan's primrose waistcoat shook gaily to his laughter. You should see him, he said, when his body loses its balance. Wandering Angus I call him. I am sure he has an idée fixe, Haynes said, pinching his chin thoughtfully with thumb and forefinger. Now I am speculating what it would be likely to be. Such persons always have. Buck Mulligan bent across the table gravely. They drove his wits astray, he said, by visions of hell. He will never capture the attic note. The note of Swinburne, of all poets, the white death and the ruddy birth. That is his tragedy. He can never be a poet. The joy of creation. Eternal punishment, Haynes said, nodding curtly. I see. I tackled him this morning on belief. There was something on his mind, I saw. It's rather interesting because Professor Picorni of Vienna makes an interesting point out of that. Buck Mulligan's watchful eyes saw the waitress come. He helped her to unload her tray. He can find no trace of hell in ancient Irish myth, Haynes said, amid the cheerful cups. The moral idea seems lacking, the sense of destiny, of retribution. Rather strange he should have just that fixed idea. Does he write anything for your movement? He sank two lumps of sugar deftly longwise through the whipped cream. Buck Mulligan slid a steaming scone in two and plastered butter over its smoking pith. He bit off a soft piece hungrily. Ten years, he said, chewing and laughing. He is going to write something in ten years. Seems a long way off, Haynes said, thoughtfully lifting his spoon. Still, I shouldn't wonder if he did after all. He tasted a spoonful from the creamy cone of his cup. This is real Irish cream I take it, he said with forbearance. I don't want to be imposed on. Elijah, skiff, light crumpled throwaway, sailed eastward by flanks of ships and trawlers, amid an archipelago of corks, beyond New Wapping Street past Benson's Ferry, and by the three-masted schooner Rosavine from Bridgewater with bricks. Almidano Artifoni walked past Hall Street, past Sewell's Yard. Behind him Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdall Farrell, with stick umbrella dust coat dangling, shunned the lamp before Mr. Law Smith's house and, crossing, walked along Marion Square. Distantly behind him a blind stripling tapped his way by the wall of College Park. Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdall Farrell walked as far as Mr. Lewis Warner's cheerful windows, then turned and strode back along Marion Square, his stick umbrella dust coat dangling. At the corner of Wilde's house he halted, frowned at Elijah's name announced on the Metropolitan Hall, frowned at the distant pleasance of Duke's lawn. His eyeglass flashed frowning in the sun. With rat's teeth bared he muttered, Coactus Valu. He strode on for Clare Street, grinding his fierce word. As he strode past Mr. Bloom's dental windows the sway of his dust coat brushed rudely from its angle a slender tapping cane and swept onwards, having buffeted a thuless body. The blind stripling turned his sickly face after the striding form. God's curse on you, he said sourly, whoever you are. You're blinder nor I am, you bitches bastard. Opposite Ruggy O'Donohoe's master Patrick Aloysius Dignam, pawing the pound and a half of mangans, late Fahrenbach's, pork steaks he had been sent for, went along warm Wicklow Street dawdling. It was too blooming dull sitting in the parlor with Mrs. Stower and Mrs. Quigley and Mrs. McDowell and the blind down and they all at their sniffles and sipping sups of the superior tawny sherry Uncle Barney brought from Tunney's. And they eating crumbs of the cottage fruitcake, jawing the whole blooming time and sighing. After Wicklow Lane the window of Madame Doyle, court dress milliner, stopped him. He stood looking in at the two puckers stripped to their pelts and putting up their props. From the side mirrors two morning masters Dignam gaped silently. Myler Kyo, Dublin's pet lamb, will meet Sergeant Major Bennett, the Portobello bruiser, for a purse of fifty sovereigns. Gob, that'd be a good pucking match to see. Myler Keo, that's the chap sparring out to him with the green sash. Two bar entrance, soldiers half price. I could easy do a bunk on Ma. Master Dignam on his left turned as he turned. That's me in morning. When is it? May the 22nd. Sure, the blooming thing is all over. He turned to the right and on his right Master Dignam turned, his cap awry, his collar sticking up. Buttoning it down, his chin lifted, he saw the image of Marie Kendall, charming soubrette, beside the two puckers. One of them mo that do be in the packets of fag stow or smokes that his old fellow welted hell out of him for one time he found out. Master Dignam got his collar down and dawdled on. The best pucker going for strength was Fitzsimons. One puck in the wind from that fellow would knock you into the middle of next week, man but the best pucker for science was Jem Corbett before Fitzsimons knocked the stuffings out of him, dodging and all. In Grafton Street Master Dignam saw a red flower in a toff's mouth and a swell pair of kicks on him and he listening to what the drunk was telling him and grinning all the time. No Sandy Mount tram. 
Master Dignam walked along Nassau Street, shifted the pork steaks to his other hand. His collar sprang up again and he tugged it down. The blooming stud was too small for the buttonhole of the shirt, blooming end to it. He met schoolboys with satchels. I'm not going tomorrow either, stay away till Monday. He met other schoolboys. Do they notice I'm in mourning? Uncle Barney said he'd get it into the paper tonight. Then they'll all see it in the paper and read my name printed and Pa's name. His face got all grey instead of being red like it was and there was a fly walking over it up to his eye. The scrunch that was when they were screwing the screws into the coffin, and the bumps when they were bringing it downstairs. Pa was inside it and Ma crying in the parlor and Uncle Barney telling the men how to get it round the bend. A big coffin it was, and high and heavy looking. How was that? The last night Pa was boost he was standing on the landing there bawling out for his boots to go out to Tunney's for to boost more and he looked buddy and short in his shirt. Never see him again. Death, that is. Pa is dead. My father is dead. He told me to be a good son to Ma. I couldn't hear the other things he said but I saw his tongue and his teeth trying to say it better. Poor Pa. That was Mr. Dignam, my father. I hope he's in purgatory now because he went to confession to Father Conroy on Saturday night. William Humble, Earl of Dudley, and Lady Dudley, accompanied by Lieutenant Colonel Hesseltine, drove out after luncheon from the Vice Regal Lodge. In the following carriage were the Honorable Mrs. Paget, Miss de Courcy, and the Honorable Gerald Ward A. D. C. In attendance. The cavalcade passed out by the lower gate of Phoenix Park, saluted by obsequious policemen, and proceeded past Kingsbridge along the northern quays. The Viceroy was most cordially greeted on his way through the metropolis. At Bloody Bridge, Mr. Thomas Kernan beyond the river greeted him vainly from afar. Between Queen's and Whitworth Bridges, Lord Dudley's viceregal carriages passed and were unsaluted by Mr. Dudley White, B. L. M. A., who stood on Aaron Key outside Mrs. Emmy White's, the pawnbroker's, at the corner of Aaron Street West, stroking his nose with his forefinger, undecided whether he should arrive at Fibsboro more quickly by a triple change of tram or by hailing a car or on foot through Smithfield, Constitution Hill, and Broadstone Terminus. In the porch of four courts Richie Goulding with the coast bag of Goulding, Collis and Ward saw him with surprise. Past Richmond Bridge at the doorstep of the office of Reuben J. Dodd, solicitor, agent for the Patriotic Insurance Company, an elderly female about to enter changed her plan and retracing her steps by King's window smiled credulously on the representative of His Majesty. From its sluice inwood key wall under Tom Devon's office Pottle River hung out in fealty a tongue of liquid sewage. Above the cross blind of the Ormond Hotel, gold by bronze, Miss Kennedy's head by Miss Deuce's head watched and admired. On Ormond Key Mr. Simon Dedalus, steering his way from the greenhouse for the sub-sheriff's office, stood still in mid-street and brought his hat low. His Excellency graciously returned Mr. Dedalus' greeting. From Cahill's corner the Reverend Hugh C. Love, M. A., made obeisance unperceived, mindful of Lord's deputies whose hands benignant had held of your rich ad -vousins. On Grattan Bridge Lenahan and McCoy, taking leave of each other, watched the carriages go by. Passing by Roger Green's office and Delar's big red printing house Jerdy McDowell, carrying the Catesby's cork lino letters for her father who was laid up, knew by the style it was the Lord and Lady Lieutenant but she couldn't see what Her Excellency had on because the tram and Springs big yellow furniture van had to stop in front of her on account of its being the Lord Lieutenant. Beyond Lundy Foots from the shaded door of Kavanaugh's wine rooms John Wise Nolan smiled with unseen coldness towards the Lord Lieutenant General and General Governor of Ireland. The Right Honorable William Humble, Earl of Dudley, G. C. V. O. Past Mickey Anderson's all times ticking watches and Henry and James's wax smart suited fresh cheeked models, the gentleman Henry, Dernier Cree James. Over against Dame Gate, Tom Rochford and Nosy Flynn watched the approach of the cavalcade. Tom Rochford, seeing the eyes of Lady Dudley fixed on him, took his thumbs quickly out of the pockets of his claret waistcoat and doffed his cap to her. A charming soubrette, great Marie Kendall with dobby cheeks and lifted skirt smiled daubly from her poster upon William Humble, Earl of Dudley, and upon Lieutenant Colonel H. G. Heseltine, and also upon the Honorable Gerald Ward A.D.C. from the window of the D.B.C. Buck Mulligan Gailey, and Haynes gravely, gazed down on the vice-regal equipage over the shoulders of eager guests, whose mass of forms darkened the chessboard whereon John Howard Parnell looked intently. In Founds's street Dilly Dedalus, straining her sight upward from Chardinal's first French primer, saw sunshade spanned and Will spoke spinning in the glare. John Henry Mentone, filling the doorway of commercial buildings, stared from wine big oyster eyes, holding a fat gold hunter watch not looked at in his fat left hand not feeling it. Where the foreleg of King Billy's horse pawed the air Mrs. Breen plucked her hastening husband back from under the hoofs of the outriders. 
she shouted in his ear the tidings. Understanding, he shifted his tomes to his left breast and saluted the second carriage. The Honorable Gerald Ward A. D. C., agreeably surprised, made haste to reply. At Ponsonby's corner a jaded white flagon H halted and four tall-hatted white flagons halted behind him, E.L.Y.'s, while outriders pranced past in carriages. Opposite Piggott's music ware rooms Mr. Dennis J. Maginney, professor of dancing and C., gaily apparelled, gravely walked, out passed by a viceroy and unobserved. By the provost's wall came jauntily Blazes Boylan, stepping in tan shoes and socks with sky-blue clocks to the refrain of my girl's a Yorkshire girl. Blazes Boylan presented to the leader's sky-blue frontlets and high action a sky-blue tie, a wide-brimmed straw hat at a rakish angle and a suit of indigo serge. His hands in his jacket pockets forgot to salute but he offered to the three ladies the bold admiration of his eyes and the red flower between his lips. As they drove along Nassau Street His Excellency drew the attention of his bowing consort to the program of music which was being discoursed in College Park. Unseen brazen highland laddies blared and drum-thumped after the cortege, but though she's a factory lass and wears no fancy clothes. Barapam. Yet I've a sort of a Yorkshire relish for my little Yorkshire rose. Barapam. Thither of the wall the quarter-mile flat handicappers, M. C. Green, H. Shrift, T. M. Patey, C. Scaife, J. B. Jeffs, G. and Morphy, F. Stevenson, C. Adderley and W. C. Huggard, started in pursuit. Striding past Finn's Hotel Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdall Farrell stared through a fierce eyeglass across the carriages at the head of Mr. M. E. Solomons in the window of the Austro-Hungarian vice-consulate. Deep in Leinster Street by Trinity's postern a loyal king's man, hornblower, touched his tally cap. As the glossy horses pranced by Marion Square Master Patrick Aloysius Dignam, waiting, saw salutes being given to the gent with the topper and raised also his new black cap with fingers greased by porksteak paper. His collar too sprang up. The Viceroy, on his way to inaugurate the Miris Bazaar in aid of funds for Mercer's Hospital, drove with his following towards Lower Mount Street. He passed a blind stripling opposite Broadbent's. In Lower Mount Street a pedestrian in a brown Macintosh, eating dry bread, passed swiftly and unscathed across the Viceroy's path. At the Royal Canal Bridge, from his hoarding, Mr. Eugene Stratton, his blub lips agrin, bade all comers welcome to Pembroke Township. At Haddington Road corner two sanded women halted themselves, an umbrella and a bag in which eleven cockles rolled to view with one to the Lord Mayor and Lady Mayoress without his golden chain. On Northumberland and Lansdowne Roads His Excellency acknowledged punctually salutes from rare male walkers, the salute of two small schoolboys at the garden gate of the house said to have been admired by the late Queen when visiting the Irish capital with her husband, the Prince Consort, in 1849 and the salute of all Mydano Artifoni's sturdy trousers swallowed by a closing door.